Okay, I've been gone for two weeks. So before I ask this, just remember, it's been a long time. Good morning, Restoration Church. Good morning. Hey, look at that. I have to preface it that way every week. So good morning. We're, we're so glad that you guys are here this morning and that you're excited to be here, obviously. Um, so the sun's shining, and I know everybody would rather be outside, but I'm super excited that you guys are here this morning. Um, has it not been a busy season? Not just me. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I, I experienced bloody Sunday, bloody Sunday last week. Uh, for the, I, It's three weeks in a row we got to say it, so I figured I would try, I'd try it again myself. But um, we did that with minimal tears. Fair was fantastic. I spent personal time with my big girls for uh, the two bigs out of the four uh, for an entire week. So it was a beautiful, beautiful blessing. Um, but, I mean, it's just we had a, a, a Sean and Hannah are not here this morning because they got married yesterday. That's right. They're not here, but they better be watching. And if they're not, we're going to have a discussion. Because um, they don't fly out till tomorrow. But uh, super excited for them. It's Matt's birthday. Uh, it is Charlie's birthday. Uh, right? Look at that little, little smiling five-year-old face. So it has just literally been... What? It is Sherry's birthday? Yesterday? It is. I did wish you a happy birthday. So... Yeah, it has just been extremely busy. We had Freedom Fest this week. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways because I can. Um, Restoration Church gave $2,500 at Freedom Fest this week. All right? That's because of your giving. Not, right? Freedom Fest? Oh, I'm sorry. Freedom Fest. So we support Freedom Builders. They're one of our three big accounts that we cover, right? Uh, that we support and give, uh, 100% of your contributions give to. Freedom Fest is their yearly big, big, big deal uh, fundraiser, right? Um, so four of us got to participate that in this year. We were blessed enough to be able to do that. That's $2,500. And I know it's not about the money, but that was an impact directly that you made. Without each one of you giving and following God's leading in your heart to give to that, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And because of that, those things will go towards wheelchair ramps. That's going to go towards windows, roofs, furnaces, any and every construction need. So that way, part, we as a church and other churches and Freedom Builder staff can partner with people to use that as a tool to share the gospel with them. And that is all because of what you guys do. So if you guys believe in what we do here, if you want to partner with that, restorationtc.com, then you can also go to the giving page and you can give, it, give there. 100% of what you give, if it's not specifically earmarked for the overhead account, will go to outreach. Just like that, we are able to give a large sum of money to them to make sure that uh, they can continue doing God's work. So uh, with that, Brian, are you ready? He said talk long enough so he can get ready. So. Did you say a prayer? You're good? Oh, sorry. That's the, that was actually the only thing he asked me to say. So, September 12th. This is what happens when you're gone for two weeks. Um, so, uh, September 12th. This is something we can celebrate. It will be our one-year anniversary. Yeah. So, um, through COVID and everything that's happened, we are not only making it, we are just growing and exploding, right? And uh, as a board member, we get to see every bit and piece of this church and where we reach. Um, and we are super, super blessed that you all have chosen to be a part of this uh, and to follow God's leading on your heart here at Restoration. So we are going to celebrate that September 12th uh, here at the brewery. Bring a dish to pass. There will be pulled pork. There better be. If there's not, I was promised already, so there better be pulled pork. Um, even if you make it just for me, just, you know. Uh, but bring a dish to pass. We're going to celebrate our one-year anniversary and then also look towards the future and what God's got for Restoration Church. So if you bow your heads with me, we'll pray, and Brian's going to bring the word. So. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, thank you uh, for this church. Thank you for the last year plus uh, um, that um, what you've done at this church. Lord, we look forward to what you're going to continue to do here and in the future. Um, Lord, just thank you for all of your abundant blessings that you poured out on us. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit be with us this morning as Brian brings the word that you speak in and through him. We ask all of these things in your name. Amen. All right. I don't know what I'm doing there. 
Imagine you are uh, going out on a trip, and this is your first time you've been away from your family. This is the very first time you, you don't, you've never been away from your family before. And, and you're going to go on this super long journey. You're not sure when you're going to be back. Your, your camel's all packed up. You're ready to go. The camel is, is waiting outside, ready for you to, to get on it and get going. You've got a mission to do. You, you're, you're ready with all the food. You don't know how long this journey is going to last. You don't know what is, is going to be uh, ahead of you. You just know that mom told you to go, and so did dad. And they said, go find a wife. Go find a wife. Don't marry anyone in this land because we don't like any of these women here. They're not good enough for you. You know how moms are. These women aren't good enough for you. My sweet baby boy, Jacob, it's time for you to go. Also, your brother wants to kill you. That's a good reason to leave as well. Your brother wants to kill you. Your dad's upset with you. Jacob, it's time for you to go and, and find a wife. I know, I know. You're just out of, out of child rearing. You're 70 years old. But it's time for you to step out of the house and start working on your own. Start doing your own thing. It's time to go find a wife. That's where we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 28 today, in this story of <clears throat> why this family? Why did God choose this family? Why did he choose to, to, to have Jesus come from this line, from the line of Abraham, which was a pretty cool guy, made some mistakes, but ultimately a pretty cool guy. Then you've got Isaac, who had a favorite son. Also, he's okay, but he wanted to do things his own way. We found that out last week, didn't we? for those of you that were here. <clears throat> and then we have Jacob and Esau. One of them, a child, still at 70 years old, doesn't know what to do with his own life. He's given away his birthright. He's given away his inheritance, everything, just for a little bit of soup. And then he's tricked by his younger brother, so he wants to kill him because that was his inheritance, even though he gladly gave it away for just a little bit of soup. And then there's Jacob, who is a trickster, that's what his name basically means, is he's, he's a trickster. And he tries to get his own way. He schemes to get his own way all the time. He must get that from his mom. Because she schemes to get things her own way as well. I want to read Genesis uh, 27. It's not going to be on your screen here, but it is in your Bible. Uh, starting in 46, just want to give us a little bit of co context to where we're going today. <clears throat> Says, then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. That's where they live. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? She knows that her son Esau wants to kill her son Jacob, and Jacob is her favorite. So she's going to tell Isaac, her husband, it's time to send Jacob away to find a wife. <clears throat> verse, uh, verse 1 in chapter 28, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there, one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus, Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. We have a transferring of blessing. This was a blessing that first God gave to Abraham, saying, I'm going to bless you with multitudes of nations. You're going to have, you're not even going to be able to count how many descendants you have. I'm going to bless you like this. And then you've got Abraham passing that blessing on to Isaac after he nearly sacrifices him. And he passes that blessing on to Isaac. And now Isaac is passing on this blessing to his son, Jacob. It's a transfer of blessing. We see in, uh, in, in this description, God Almighty, bless you, in verse 3. God Almighty, that means El Shaddai. That was something that was a new name for God. He, he gave it to himself. When you're God, you can give yourself names that describe who you are. And he gives himself this name of the Almighty God, El Shaddai. And he gave it to Abraham when Abraham was 99 years old. And Abraham passed that on to Isaac. Isaac is now passing that on to Jacob. 
Isaac is passing on this blessing to Jacob, the son. I don't know what it's like for you, but if you ever hear stories of your dad, from your dad, like, do you, here's, here's what happened in my life. My dad has shared several stories, some of them uh, not great, some of them, <laughs> some of them I can share here, um, <clears throat> but he would, he, would, he would share stories with us, and I don't know if your dad ever did that with you, just like, this is what it was like for me growing up, this is what my life was like, and this is the faith that I want you to have. Jacob is passing on what he knows about his life, and what, or Isaac is passing on what he knows to Jacob and sharing these stories. Verse 6. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, and that as he blessed him and directed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Neboah, Neb. Esau thinks that he can do exactly what Jacob is doing. He's like, oh, maybe that's what's going to make my, my parents happy. I know they're not super happy with me right now with the stuff that, maybe if I go marry one of the descendants of, of Isaac's dad, maybe then I will also get some sort of a blessing. He's still trying to do everything he can. He's looking at Jacob and he's like, okay, Jacob is sent out there to go get a wife. I'm not going to go follow Jacob because that's not for me uh, because I'm not going to be uh, the, the, the servant of my younger brother. That's not going to happen. And so maybe I'll do, you know what? I know he also had uh, Ishmael's son. Maybe I'll go over to that tribe over there and see if I can find a wife. So Esau goes over there, tries to find a wife, his third wife, actually. He's already married two Hittite women. What's one more, right? It's kind of like kids. You have two kids, what's three, right? After three, what's four? I mean, why not just go for, for nine, right? No, women are like, no, why are you, don't say those things. That's awful. Two, you, can, you, can, uh, you, you, you have at least an equal playing field. When there's three, you're, you're outnumbered and you're in trouble. <clears throat> Esau is trying to do things his own way and he's, he's doing it without God. How many times do we want the approval of our parents and we think, maybe if I just do that, maybe if I just go and, and, and get a degree in this. I thought I needed to go be an accountant in, in a previous time of my life. I was like, well, that's what people do. They have really boring jobs. No offense to my dad, but he worked at Amway and he was a supervisor and uh, that's what he did for, for 25 years before he became a pastor. So I just thought, you know what? All you got to do is just get a boring job and just live a, a boring life. That's what's going to make my parents happy, I guess. So I'm just going to go be an accountant. Ugh, can you imagine me being an accountant? <laughs> that would not go well for me at all. Uh, this is what Esau is doing. He's just doing whatever he can to get in right standing with his parents. Never mind what God wants him to do. Never mind that he's already messed his life up. All they need to do is repent, but he's like, I'm not going to do that. Maybe if I do more, maybe if I just do more actions, that's what's going to get me ahead. Man, that's how we feel with God too, isn't it? I didn't even think about this, but that's what we do with God, isn't it? Like, oh, God must not be happy with me. I'm going to go see, maybe I'm going to head to church today because I know God's probably not happy with what I did last night. I, I know God's not happy with me, so I'm going to make sure that I do some community service. I'm going to do some good for my community today. Maybe that's what's going to make God happy with me. But all God wants is us to repent from what we're doing and just follow him. That is that simple. We, we try to fill our lives up with so much stuff like maybe this will make God happy. Maybe this will make God happy. God is in love with you. No matter where you're at in life, God is in love with you. As far away as I've ever been to God, I've felt away from God. He loves me as much in that moment as he does in this moment right now preaching. His love never changes. It's the overwhelming, all-consuming, reckless love of God that he cannot stop loving us. And there's nothing we can do that's going to change his love. The question is, are we going to accept that love? That was a tangent I wasn't planning on going on, so let's keep going. Verse 10, 
Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and all your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God shows up personally to Jacob. Before this, Jacob has just heard about the God of Abraham. He's heard about the God of Isaac and Rebekah. He's heard about this God, but he's never experienced this God before in his own life. And this is the moment where he finally sees God for the first time, 70 plus years. Now he knows about God. He's seen, he's, he's seen his parents interact with this most high God. He's seen how it's sort of changed their, their lives, not completely, but I mean a little bit. He's heard the stories about grandpa, about Abraham leaving his family behind. See, it's important that God finally shows up to Jacob personally. He's no longer gonna be riding on the coattails of his parents' faith which a lot of us do. I grew up in a little Baptist church and, and I, I, I think I was going to church from the day I was born. I think the day I was born was like a Sunday morning. We had, I was born and then, uh, and then my parents left the hospital and we went to church that day. I'm pretty sure that's how, that's how Baptist we were. We went to church on Sunday. We went to church on Tuesday night for prayer meeting. We went to Awana on Wednesday night. We had, uh, sometimes my parents cleaned the church, so we were there on Friday or Saturday. We were always at church. And then I had youth group, and then we had a Sunday night service back when Sunday night church was a cool thing. Not really a cool thing, but it was something you had to do. Even during the Super Bowl. But I didn't make that faith my own until later on. It was my parents' faith. It was my parents' God. It was my parents' Jesus. It was my parents' church. When did it become my church? There was times along the way. And I hope for all of us that we can look back. If we grew up in the church, I hope we're not still resting on our parents' faith. Jacob is no longer going to be resting on his parents' faith, sort of. As with most people, he, he never quite gets it right kind of like us. Verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob saw the stairway to heaven before it was a song. I guess we should have done that song this morning. Uh, maybe we can, Mike, can you come up here and just bust that song out real quick? Thank you. You and Noah can just get together, play it for us. We'll take a quick break, intermission. <laughs> Jacob realizes that he's standing on holy ground in this moment because this is where he saw God. This is where he experienced God for the very first time. And he responds in a proper way, in fear and awe. He's in awe of who this God is and where he's standing. He had a fear that made him worship this God. Sometimes we, I think we, um, as, as Christians, I know I do this, I get very lackadaisical in my relationship with Jesus. I get very just like, oh, he's a friend of sinners. And that's true, he is a friend of sinners. He's my friend. Jesus is my friend. There was a shirt a long time ago, a few years ago, that said, Jesus is my homeboy. I don't know about that. Sometimes we lose the respect and the awe and the wonder of who God actually is and how big this God actually is. He's closer than a brother, yes. He's as, he's as intimate as we can possibly be with him. He, 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 he's more than that, though. He's an all-powerful God who knows everything, who's outside of time right now looking down at what's happening or looking, I don't know where, where he is in all of time and space. I don't know if he's looking down or looking across. It doesn't really matter. 
He's outside of time and he's seeing what's happening. He's seeing the story of Jacob playing out right now at the same time that we're meeting in this brewery. God is outside of time. We've shared this before. I don't know if it's, I, I think it's good theology. He can look like the pages of a book. He can just flip through them and see what's happening and what's gonna be the end. That's the all-powerful God that we serve and we love and we worship. That's the all-powerful God that we're meeting with here today. And Jacob realizes that. Verse 18, so early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on it, on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Jacob builds a place to keep God. Did you ever, ever as a kid, did you ever, uh, I've, I've done this, like you get those little bug catcher things and you're like, ah, oh, like you find a weird like uh, spider or something or, or, or a caterpillar, mostly caterpillars because I was afraid of spiders. So I would, I, would, I would touch the fuzzy caterpillars a little bit, like maybe with a stick. But I would, I would want to keep like, this is, look at that colorful, like orange and black, this caterpillar. Wow, what an amazing caterpillar. I'm going to keep this caterpillar for the rest of my life. And you go get like a little mason jar and then you tighten it real tight so that the caterpillar won't get out, right? And then you just, you leave it there for a few days and you keep looking at this beautiful caterpillar and then a few days later, it's not really moving anymore. Or maybe a few hours later, it's not really moving anymore. You accidentally kill this little caterpillar. Never happened to me in my life before, but I'm just speaking hypothetically that this could happen. Did you ever do that where you just like, I mean, and then we got smart and there was like the actual bug catchers you could with like the mesh over it. Did you guys ever have anything like that? No? Yeah, maybe a little. Okay, a few of us did. Thank you. Um, maybe the people online would be able to explain <laughs> or like interact with me. Uh, you, you want to keep this thing as a pet. And basically, Jacob is having the same thing. There's this experience that he has with God, and he's like, oh, this must be where God is. This must be the place where I get to worship God. And as Christians, I want to say that don't we do the exact same thing? Don't kill your faith by relegating it to a place. Like how we killed the caterpillar. I, not we. I, it was all me, okay? I killed the caterpillar in the mason jar. But we, t we tend to think that, okay, this is the place where God is. This is the place where I get to put my Jesus on, right? People will say that on social media, going to get my Jesus on. Why isn't he on all the time? What, you have to go to a place to get your Jesus on. That's, that's not the good theology. Jesus is everywhere. He's within us. If we ask him as our Savior to be our Savior, to live within us, his Holy Spirit lives within us. I know that might be weird theology to some of you, but it's the truth. And I'm not going to get behind uh, just sugarcoating truth. I'm going to tell you the truth like it is. If you accept Jesus as your Savior, he lives within you. And we become the church. It's no longer a building that is the church. That's why we can meet in a brewery. That's why we can meet wherever we want. It's not about the building. It's about the relationship with Jesus. And too many times, we make it about the place. Jesus is our God, not a place. A lot of us, maybe we grew up in, in church, or some of us did, maybe not all of us. And again, we liken it to our, maybe, maybe you grew up Catholic. And I hear a lot of people say, I'm, I'm Catholic. I thought, oh, cool, all right. Uh, what, what church do you go to? I don't, <laughs> but I'm Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Okay, so are you or are you, are you not? Like, if, in order to be Catholic, I think you have to go and it's not like, a, it's not like a, a, a gene that you're born with. You're not just born Catholic. You have to become Catholic. But we make it about a place and, and, and we make it about a, a, a family heritage much more than just a personal relationship. Jesus is our God, not a place. Jacob is 
he does a few things wrong here. First and foremost is that he sets up this rock, which wasn't necessarily wrong, to set up a rock and have a remembrance, a memorial of where he found God for the very first time. I'm not saying we shouldn't have those markers in our life where, when God like, shows up and, and, and in an amazing way in our life. If that happens, it doesn't happen to everybody. Sometimes it's just more of a mundane faith. But if you've had a, a revelatory experience with God, sometimes we can put place markers on that. Oh, that's the place where I learned this about God. I remember there was a camp that I went to. Uh, I was a worship leader at a camp, a men's camp, and I, and I didn't want to go uh, because I just I didn't want to go, but I, I had to lead worship there. And so I did, and, and, and the experience I had there, it wasn't the speaker, it, wasn't, it was probably the worship leader, but it, I mean, it wasn't all the worship leader. And um, you get that? Uh, I, I, I remember just having time with God but I don't go back to that place thinking, okay, that's where I have to go experience God. That's where God lives, so I need to go back there. That's what Jacob is doing. He's setting up this thing to be like, okay, if I ever want to come back to God, I have to go back to Bethel, back to this place where I put the rock where I was sleeping on. Couldn't have been that large of a rock, really, but he put it, this little rock there, and, and he's like, that's where, where I'm going to worship God from now on. And he doesn't get what God told him in the dream, was that he's going to be with him wherever he goes. That's kind of an important part. He says, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. It was the last thing God said to him before Jacob woke up. And Jacob decides, this rock here is where God lives. And I'm going to come back here every day because this is where God lives and I'm going to go now. He wakes up with this experience and he's not very confident either. So for us, Jesus is our God, not a place. So many times we make it about the place. I follow this person or I follow that person. Jesus is our ladder. He's our ladder. This little dream that we have, God is coming down and up and the angels are coming down and up. It's this avenue in which Jacob experiences God and the way that we experience God is through Jesus Christ. He became the ladder for us. There's that Christian ghetto uh, picture. I'm sorry if you don't know what that means, but um, I do in my brain, so just go with me, okay? It's that, that picture of, of there's, there's two, like a canyon on either, like there's a canyon and there's two pieces of land and then like the cross comes down because it was on a PowerPoint presentation when we figured out PowerPoint in the Baptist church. And then like the, this cross came down and filled that gap perfectly and it said Jesus. And on one side was sin and it was humanity and it was me. And then on the other side was God and his righteousness and the angels and everything. And then Jesus comes down and he fills that gap for us. Jesus is our ladder. He's our access to the one true God because of what he did for us. Jesus lived a perfect life, a blameless life. And he died a sinner's death, the death that was meant for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. Jesus is our ladder. Jesus says himself in, in, in John 14, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the ladder. I don't want to burst your bubbles here today, but... Gandhi's not the ladder. Buddha is not the ladder. <laughs> I'm not the ladder. <laughs> we know that for sure. Your favorite pastor is not the ladder. Your favorite church is not the ladder. Jesus is the only one who's that ladder. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Now, what does that mean for everybody else? <laughs> That's above my pay grade. But I know there's a heaven and I know there's a hell and I know Jesus is the one who paved that way for us. And I'm not going to stand away from that. We need to stand for truth. And I can be confident in that because Jesus is our confidence. He is our confidence. 
not anything that I do. For some reason, Jacob had no confidence in this. If you look at that passage at the, at the very end, when his response is when he's going to build that little, little, uh, little rock, he said uh, in verse 20, it says, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, if God just said it, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I can, if he gives me journey mercies, if he gives me protection, if he gives me food, if he gives me this, if he gives me this, if, if God is willing to give me an easy life, I'll follow him. If God is willing to make sure that nothing bad ever happens to me ever again, I'll follow him. If God can make sure that I, I never get sick, I never die, I never, do it, I never lose my job, I find the perfect woman or the perfect man to marry, I find and nothing bad ever happens in my life. If those things happen, then maybe I'll think about following God. And he, God promised that he was going to be with us. He didn't say that we were going to have an easy life, but he did say that he was going to be with us. Jesus is our confidence. We can go fully into the world knowing who Jesus is and what he's done for us and that no matter what happens to this body, Jesus is going to meet me at the end. He's my confidence. It's not in a vaccine. I'm not anti-vax, don't, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not getting into that argument well, even, even a little bit, so I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna leave it right where it is, okay? But what I'm saying is something is always going to be killing you. So what's your confidence in? Is it in a vaccine? Well, you know what? That's gonna fail at some point. We're, we're going to get sick at some point. We're gonna die at some point. A vaccine can't be our confidence. Political figures certainly cannot be our confidence. We know that, right? Some, I mean, maybe we know that. Sometimes we put our confidence in a political figure. Oh, they're going to be the ones that, that bring this country back to its, its roots the way that it was supposed to be. Or this is the best way that we're going to go from now on. This is, what, this, is, this is the politician that's really going to do the things that I want him to do or her to do. They're going to fail. They're people just like you and me. Maybe not like us, maybe a little worse. <laughs> I should probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of us follow, or not a lot of us, in a culture today we have, have people who will follow an influencer or something like that. I don't even exactly know what an influencer does except influence something. But they're just people who pretend to be rich or, or some of them actually are rich and they show it. And then it's like, wow, I want to be that. That's going to be my confidence. Sometimes we put our, our confidence in money. Sometimes we put it in our job. Sometimes we put it in another person that's living the life that we want to live on social media, but the rest of their life is complete crap. What's our confidence in? I want to go over to 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'm going to start in chapter 1. I got a little bit of scripture I want to read here that Jesus is our confidence. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. There's a church in Corinth uh, in the Middle East. It's over there somewhere. And uh, he's writing letters to all of these churches. Paul the apostle was Saul, turned into Paul, um, wrote most of the New Testament. And he's writing to this church in Corinthian. He's like a mega pastor of today, okay? So pick your favorite mega pastor. That's Paul, all right? Only without any scandal. It's just Paul. Although he did murder some Christians, so there's that. <clears throat> Starting in, uh, in verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, by the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Not any other name, only the name of Jesus, by our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos. Apollo, Apollos. Sorry, I couldn't say that today. Um, or I, like, I can't trip up over the, just the normal words. <laughs> or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
You can insert any name you want to in that. Did, did, did Restoration Church go to the cross for you? Did your favorite pastor go to the cross for you? Did your favorite other religion go to the, to, to the cross for you? And it says Jesus does. I thank God, verse 14, that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else, okay? So if, if I missed anyone, that's Paul saying, if I missed anybody, don't get mad, okay? I don't know what I'm baptizing, who I'm baptizing, when I'm baptizing. I've baptized a lot of people, okay? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Jesus is our confidence, not eloquent wisdom, not the things that we can say, not the things that we can do here in this room or a small group that we're a part of or, or men's group or women's group or whatever it is. Jesus is our power. He is our confidence. I want to go over to uh, chapter 3. I've got a few more verses I want you to read. By you, I mean me, and you can follow along. Chapter 3, starting in verse 4. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, <clears throat> I still can't say that, are you not being merely human? <clears throat> what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wage according to his labor. I don't think any of that's on the screen. God gave the growth, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. It's not about anything that we do. It's not an experience that we get to have. Experiences are okay, but sometimes we have... We, we have our faith right here in this room. It's at the brewery or it's at this church that I'm at and that's the only way that I can experience God is if I go to that place. It's not through Paul. It's not through Apollos. It's not through Peter. It's not through Brian. It's not through anybody in the room except Jesus Christ. To finish it off, Paul, with this argument, says in verse 21, So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. We're all the same. We're just skin and bones trying to make it through life trying to figure out what to do, what to make for dinner. We all sleep, we eat. There's not much dividing us unless we let it divide us. But Christ is here to unite us. So we don't have to say it's this or that. It's it's only Jesus. So what will you do about Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? Well, that's the question that comes before us. Jacob decided he was just going to build a little temple, build a little rock, so he could come visit his pet whenever he wanted to. But he wasn't going to take God with him. No, he didn't want God to see the rest of his life. He didn't, he didn't want God to see what he said to that camel that cut him off in traffic. He didn't want him to see what he, what he said to his neighbor. He didn't want him to see what he was doing with his coworkers. He didn't want him to see the thoughts that were inside of his head. So he's just going to put Jesus in this little box. He's going to put God in this little box and make sure that he stays there. And if he ever wants to come visit, if he's feeling guilty or anything, he'll come visit him. Say sorry but he's just going to leave him right there. What are we going to do with Jesus? We have a couple of options. If you're a Christian, 
here this morning. Maybe you say, I've been compartmentalizing Jesus. And I need to stop doing that. I've been putting him in a little box. I've created this little place for him to be. Or maybe you're like, well, it was more of my parents' faith. Well, my wife follows Jesus, so I guess that's good enough for me. Or my husband follows Jesus, maybe that's good enough for me. My boyfriend, my girlfriend, my friends at school. It doesn't matter what they do with Jesus, it matters what you're doing with Jesus. To the non-Christian, maybe you're saying, maybe, if you've, maybe you've never followed Jesus before in your entire life. Maybe you've been putting a little bit of this religion and that religion and maybe that one. That one sounds pretty good. I think I like some of those tenets. I think I like what, what that religion is bringing to me. And I like some of the stuff. Jesus was a pretty good teacher, so maybe I'll bring some of his teaching in too. Jesus wasn't a great teacher. If Jesus was just a great teacher, he, <laughs> he failed at that because he's just a liar and a lunatic. Is Jesus a liar or is he... God. Great teachers don't lie. So if you think he's a great teacher, then you must think he's God. Because why would a great teacher completely lie about who he is over and over again and then have a movement that follows him over and over again and people get martyred for him over and over again and people leave their lives and go and follow him over and over again. It's a pretty crappy teacher if it was all just fake. If at the end he's just, like, no, nah, I was kidding. <laughs> I don't know. I think we need to wrestle with that. Maybe some of us don't need to wrestle anymore. We're going to get to a wrestling story in a few chapters where Jacob wrestles with God, an angel, potentially Jesus. We'll get to that in a few chapters. But today, what are you going to do with Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for uh, the cross and salvation. Thank you that we have Jesus. God, I pray for people in this room, if there's people that have been compartmentalizing you, God, I pray that we would just put that stuff aside and just focus on what you would have us do and see how that changes us. God, if there's people in this room who who haven't followed you or it's been a long time, God, I pray that today's the day that they rededicate or dedicate their life to you. God, that we would repent. I pray for all of us, God, that we would be focused on you and you alone. It's in your name, the name of Jesus, the strong and mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.